So I've always been fascinated by economic and political theories, and I would love for us to explore about uh, Marxism, communism, capitalism, and socialism. And so just to get us started, can you tell us briefly about the history of Marxism? Well, I assume you're referring to the theories developed by Karl Marx, born in Germany in the early part of the 19th century, passing away in the latter part of the 19th century, developing theories concerning capitalism in the first place, and then arguing that following capitalism would be systems known as socialism and communism. Uh, he wrote a number of volumes, including in German, Das Kapital, which lays out these theories. These theories, as you know, have animated the activism all over the world, not only in Europe, but in Asia and Africa. You may recall that in 1917, you had what was called the Russian Revolution, where coming to power were those denoted as communists who sought to basically implant Marxist theories. The Soviet Union lasted until 1991. Of course, there were repeated efforts by the social, by the capitalist countries, led first by the British Empire and then by its successor, that is to say the United States of America, to destabilize the Soviet Union. But before passing for the, from the scene, the Soviet Union helped to inspire, if not engineer, uh, similar revolutions in China, in the northern half of the Korean Peninsula. It inspired activism in Africa. Uh, for example, uh, you had the arising in Africa of a number of political parties that drew upon Marxist ideas, uh, speaking of Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, Seiko Toure in Guinea-Conakry, uh, others too numerous to mention. Uh, ultimately, uh, you also had the coming to power in both Mozambique and Angola in the mid-1970s of political parties, Frelimo in the case of Mozambique, MPLA in the case of Angola, uh, that were inspired by Marxist ideas. Likewise, in South Africa, you had an influential communist party uh, that still shares power with the African National Congress of South Africa. Uh, however, it's fair to say that with the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union uh, post-1991, in 1991, uh, you had the weakening of many socialist states. Uh, look at what happened to Cuba, for example, or what has happened to Cuba. There was a revolution in 1959, the coming to power of uh, what was subsequently denoted as the Cuban Communist Party, played a major role in the African continent in terms of vouchsafing the independence of Angola after apartheid South Africa and the US Central Intelligence Agency were trying to overthrow the MPLA government in Angola. Cuba sent troops to Angola to make sure that that did not happen. Uh, Cuba was in assistance to the Algerians who overthrew decades of French colonial rule by 1962. Uh, the Cubans since then have dispatched medics, nurses, doctors, health professionals, particularly to uh, Zimbabwe, uh, South Africa's northern neighbor, and to Namibia. South Africa's northern neighbor, yet it's fair to say that Cuba suffered grievously after the dissolution of the Soviet Union 
in any case, uh, that is a snapshot, a brief analysis recollection of the impact of the ideas of Karl Marx. Interestingly, most African nations did adapt most of these economic theories, right? Why was it that it was extremely difficult for African nations to come with their own political and economic theories? Well, it's like asking why we're speaking across oceans in the language that is English. Uh, that is to say that uh, to a certain degree, it provided a vocabulary that was useful and to a certain degree, Marx was arguing that he wasn't just inventing ideas out of whole cloth. He was arguing that he was describing human development and that this human development was not necessarily a development that was peculiar to Europe. He was arguing that it was a universal idea. And you had, just like with regard to capitalism, I mean, you have all of these countries that consider themselves to be capitalists. You may ask, why can't the Netherlands develop their own idea? Why do they have to be capitalists? Why can't Bulgaria, after overthrowing socialism, why can't they develop Bulgarianism? Why do they adapt capitalism? Well, reality only provides uh, certain options, uh, for example. And just like you have the capitalism that's in Scandinavia, or even the capitalism that's in Canada is not necessarily like a capitalism that's in the United States of America. The kind of socialism that was developing in Africa was not necessarily the kind of socialism that was developing in Cuba or the Soviet Union. So you, you, have, uh, you have regional and local variations on these ideas and concepts that uh, have application across humanity. And so can you tell us about capitalism and what that theory entailed? Well, it entails uh, private ownership of the means of production, although that varies. For example, the United States is a capitalist country, but you have universities that are not controlled by private interests. Uh, you have roads and highways that oftentimes are not controlled by private interests. But generally speaking, in a capitalist uh, country, individuals like South African-born Elon Musk or Bill Gates, they control the economy, develop wealth as a result, where you have millions who work <laughs> for Elon Musk, who sell their labor to Bill Gates, for a pittance that allows them to reproduce themselves to buy food and housing. So the idea of capitalism basically involves a private control, uh, individual control of the means of production. Socialism involves public control, just like you have public universities, as I said, in the United States of America. Uh, in a socialist country, you oftentimes have widespread government control, which means that it's democratically controlled because you vote your government in to office. Uh, you did not vote Elon Musk into office. You did not vote for Bill Gates. Uh, and you can only replace them by dent of revolution. Now, of course, you can help to circumscribe their ability to wreak havoc but uh, it would be difficult to replace them altogether absent a revolution. Even socialist countries vary, as I noted before. In China, for example, uh, you have uh, government control of the commanding heights of the economy, such as the banking system, electricity, uh, transport, railroads, et cetera, although you have quite a bit of private uh, interests uh, of the economy. Um, in Cuba, that is not necessarily the case. Uh, you, ha you have a very small uh, private sector in Cuba, 
individually controlled economy. It's basically small business, unlike China, for example. And so there's usually different opinions when it comes to capitalism, and some people view it as an exploitative system. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's clearly exploitative. I mean, uh, I'm speaking to you from New York City. If I step out of my hotel, sleeping on the sidewalks are individuals who cannot afford housing. You have people who are starving. This is supposedly the richest country on earth. And if that's not exploitation, I don't know what is. Plus, uh, in the United States, as you know, it was built by enslaved African labor. And there is still a legacy of racism and white supremacy in the United States of America that's breathtaking and staggering if you experience it. So it is a gross understatement to speak of capitalist countries as being exploitative. Uh, in fact, uh, they're super exploitative. They're super duper exploitative. What, what theory do you think would bring a better balance in the community? Well, obviously, more redistribution of the wealth. Is it really just to have Elon Musk have a fortune of $150 billion or more? And people sleeping on the sidewalks, uh, people going hungry, all living in the same country. Obviously, you need more public control. You need more government control. Uh, you need more control by the working class, the people who sell their labor for a pittance. Uh, obviously, that would bring a more just system. And at times people would speak of, you know, entrepreneurs, right? The Elon Musk and speak about, you know, the hard work that they put in and the investment that they make and the risk that they take and the role that they play in terms of advancing our societies, right? And so in as much as, you know, you are you are you are trying to speak on how we could, you know, create an eco society by distribution of wealth, but then how about the entrepreneurs who are the individuals that are taking risks and you know coming up with these amazing innovations that they're making the world a better place? How about that? How about it? I mean, if you look at the United States, for example, you have, take Tesla, which is Elon Musk's major enterprise, these cars that run in electricity. The success of that product is guaranteed by the government which subsidizes the price. In other words, if you buy Tesla, you get tax breaks, for example. And that money, those tax breaks come from the pockets of people like myself, and then it goes to Elon Musk. If you look at universities, for example, Elon Musk is able to recruit at publicly controlled universities, University of California, for example, it's a government institution. And so the government subsidizes the education of individuals and make sure they have intelligence and then they go work for Elon Musk. So to act as if he did this on his own without the assistance of the government is ridiculous, it's laughable. And so then the question becomes, how can the government reclaim or seize the funds that they helped to put into Tesla to make it a successful enterprise? Well, usually that's through taxes. You say that since the University of California benefited Elon Musk, he should pay taxes to the government controlled University of California to make sure that's a thriving enterprise. But of course, being a greedy capitalist, he doesn't want to pay taxes. He just wants to appropriate the intelligence of these students that has been provided by the government. And that leads, to, of course, to a political struggle. So uh, I know that it's quite common to talk about entrepreneur, entrepreneurs taking risks as if there's no government involvement, but that's a fantasy. Or, or to put it another way, it's a lie. Wow. I mean, so in as much as entrepreneurs exist that, you know, 
the government still plays a huge role in ensuring that their ventures are a success? Well, clearly. I mean, that, 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 that's all over the world. The, um, I mean, l let's say if the Elon Musk factory in Texas catches fire, well, he doesn't have his own fire department. The fire department of the government comes to put out that fire. And so therefore, he should pay taxes to support that fire department. If somebody wants to steal from his factory, it's the police department controlled by the government that makes sure that that does not happen. He should want to pay taxes to the government so they could have a police department. I've already given the example of education. Uh, there is a pricing of water that is generally controlled by the government. There's a tr pricing of electricity that oftentimes is controlled by the government, not all the time. So once again, it it's fantasy to act as if an entrepreneur is a lone ranger who operates without the assistance of government. They operate with the assistance of government and they should either A, pay fair taxes back to their government or B, the government should take over their enterprise and run it on behalf of the majority. So, and that could be one of the ways that the government can play a role in terms of addressing the economic inequalities? Well, of course, the government can play a role in addressing economic inequality through taxes, for example, uh, through taxes that redistribute the wealth. The government could pass a law that says no one should have a fortune over one billion U.S. dollars. That seems reasonable. And any sum accumulated over one billion dollars goes to the government, which then redistributes that in terms of setting up nurseries for young children, setting up schools, uh, setting up fire departments, setting up universities, uh, et cetera. So let's talk a little bit about socialism and what are the core principles of socialism? And how would you define well, it? Socialism involves, among other things, a public control of the commanding heights of the economy, the commanding heights being banking, water, electricity, transport, railroads, airplanes, et cetera. But as I said before, it can vary. Uh, in Cuba, you have government control of virtually the entire economy other than small business. In China, you have uh, considerable leeway for private business. Uh, socialism also involves a form of democratic control in terms of being able to vote for representatives who then pledge to improve the lives of the masses of individuals. Socialism oftentimes involves working class control. Uh, that is to say those who sell their labor uh, for a living then have representatives in government that exercise influence and or power and control uh, over the economy. But as noted, just like you have different forms of capitalism, you have different forms of socialism. And most of the times when you speak about growth in the African continent, economic growth, we usually speak about, you know, the Asian tigers. What, what, have they implemented in terms of economic uh, systems that enable them to become such economically powerful countries in the world within a short time? Well, to answer that question fully would take more time than we have today. But let me say that to look at it another way, uh, Africa had the disadvantage of location, being very close to Europe as Europe was expanding and therefore being subjected to the African slave trade. As well, there was a slave trade in the east of Africa 
as well that tremendously handicapped African economic development. Likewise, you had colonialism, uh, whereby a good deal of Africa was ruled uh, from Europe. Now, one way to look at world development is that Africa was fighting battles that then allowed uh, a good deal of Asia uh, to escape colonialism and to escape the slave trade. A turning point in world development comes in the 1850s when Japan is seemingly on the verge of being colonized by the United States of America. But Japan goes through a tremendous reconstruction. And within about 15 to 20 years, uh, it was able to not only escape being colonized by the United States, but to become a colonizing power itself. Uh, this sets up a conflict, a titanic conflict between Japan and the United States that explodes in war by 1941, uh, scant nine decades after the 1850s. Uh, Japan loses that war. In fact, it's subjected to atomic bombing in 1945, the only atomic bombing in the history of the world. But just like the Bolshevik or the Russian Revolution, which I mentioned a moment or two ago in 1917, had tremendous impact on world development because it was in Moscow's interest to help to weaken its foes in Western Europe, which happened to be also the foes of Africa, which is one of the reasons why Moscow supported African liberation, helping to uplift African nations, and not least South Africa itself. But as noted, you had the dissolution of the Soviet Union by 1991, a major victory for the capitalist powers and imperialist powers, and therefore a defeat for African nations. Likewise, today you have a conflict in Ukraine between the United States and its North Atlantic allies on the other, and Russia and its Chinese ally on the other hand, you might know that a good deal of African nations are not supporting the United States and NATO. In fact, as we speak, you have the president of South Africa and other leaders that are touring both Ukraine and Moscow to try to impose a peace settlement, which is a turnabout because usually you have European leaders trying to impose peace settlements in Africa. In any case, to sum up, uh, Asian nations were able to benefit from the rise of Japan. If you look at uh, South Korea, for example, uh, I should mention quickly that it, it was subjected to a brutal colonizing process by Japan from about 1910 to 1945. But at the same time, you saw the buildup of the productive forces uh, in South Korea, where now as whereas now South Korea is one of the major economies on planet Earth, and you have major enterprises like Kia, Hyundai, LG, Lucky Gold Star, et, et, et cetera. The same for uh, Taiwan, which had been colonized by Japan from the 1890s up until about 1945. The major producer of computer chips, TSMC, is headquartered in Taiwan. If you look at the Philippines, for example, which was colonized by the United States, uh, it's interesting to compare its development to South Korea. The Philippines is not one of the leading economies on planet Earth because it was sub subjected to the cruel and rapacious exploitation of US imperialism. So to answer your question uh, in brief and in summary, Africa had the disadvantage of location, of being located close to Europe. There are only eight, nine miles that supports the northern coast of Africa from the southern tip of Europe, speaking of Spain, for example. 
And then Africa had the disadvantage of being exploited from the East uh, by uh, so-called Arab nations, for example. So uh, unless you take the position that there's something wrong with African people, uh, you have to otherwise develop a uh, historically grounded materialist analysis that helps to explain Africa under development, which is what I've tried to do in the last few seconds. And so a lot of times when you speak about Africa, we usually go and analyze the history and what had happened. So what do you think Africa should be doing right now? Well, some of the things it should be doing, it is doing. Uh, for example, you have an African Union headquartered in Addis Ababa, uh, Ethiopia. You have an African continental free trade uh, area, which is trying to develop one market, not unlike the European Union's aspiration to develop one market. You have Africa generally refusing, as noted, to sign on to the U.S. proxy war in Ukraine. Uh, obviously, Africa needs to uh, devote uh, quite a bit of its treasury to education, K-12 through and university education. Uh, Africa needs to unleash the power of the working class by helping to develop unions, not only unions of workers, but unions of students, uh, for example. I mean, it, it's obvious, but of course there is internal resistance. Uh, U.S. imperialism has many allies in Africa. Uh, U.S. imperialism has shown that it's willing to overthrow African governments that uh, it does not agree with. So it's a political struggle. It's not enough to say, what should Africa be doing uh, when you have U.S. imperialism and North Atlantic imperialism interfering in the internal affairs of African states, preventing often these nations from doing the right thing. You mentioned earlier that Russia did help African countries gain independence. Is there a partner that Africa can ally themselves with right now that can help them well, in terms of economic development? Well, sure. You know, there's Cuba, there's China. Uh, there are the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, which are, that's this informal alliance that's meeting in South Africa in a few weeks. Uh, obviously, Africa needs to de-emphasize ties with the North Atlantic countries, particularly the United States of America. And if to the extent that it has ties with the United States of America, uh, it should be in the realm of healthcare, for example. It should be in the realm of education. Uh, the United States su uh, supplying scholarships to African students, but then again, Russia and China supply scholarships to African students as well. And so a lot that has been going on about China using you know, loans as a way to exploit the African continent, African countries, is that propaganda simply because the China is providing an alternative for African countries? It's largely propaganda. I mean, the United States is rather hysterical now about the rise of China. Because let's face it, the rise of China suggests that for the first time in 500 years, you have the prospect of the dominant power on planet Earth not being a European power like Portugal or Spain or Britain or a quasi-European power like the United States of America, but it being an Asian power. Not only that, but an Asian power, China, that's ruled by a communist party when anti-communism is part of the mother's milk of politics in the North Atlantic country. So obviously they're hysterical about the rise of China. I mean, uh, and that's why they'll do anything in their power to try to keep that from happening. Up to and including war, by the way. But it is happening. I mean, you can see the type of uh, agreements that China is entering with African countries. Oh, sure. Um, although in the interests of a full picture, uh, I should say, for those who are wondering how China got into this advantageous position, 
Well, part of the explanation is that uh, China decided to cut deals with US imperialism against the interests of the Soviet Union. That happened about a half century ago. And it's not unlike what London did. I wrote a book called The Dawning of the Apocalypse. Perhaps when you edit this, you can put that title on the screen. And it tells the story of the rise of the British Empire. Because in the 1500s, uh, England was a minor monarchy on the fringes of Europe, but it got caught up in the Protestant secession from the Catholic Church, which leads to religious wars between Protestants and Catholics, between Spain on the one hand, a Catholic power, and England on the other hand, the Protestant power. This is happening at the same time that uh, you see the expansion of the Spanish Empire. And interestingly enough, as I point out in that book, uh, Spain takes the position that you can only be a settler in its empire if you're Catholic. London, the scrappy underdog, uh, does not have that advantage, that, that not that many Protestants to go around. So they move from religion as a marker of society to, quote, race, which means that uh, it establishes pan-European settlements in the Americas, ultimately in Africa itself, and begins to exploit on the basis of race, on the basis of being of African descent or not being of European descent. And so in some ways, what China does by turning its back on its erstwhile socialist ally in Moscow, is the same thing that London does. It turns its back on its erstwhile Christian ally, speaking of Spain. But obviously that benefited many in London and what China did helped to benefit China. But uh, my position is let bygones be bygones. That's history. The fact of the matter is that China is now challenging U.S. imperialism. Uh, I'm not going to be distracted from my overall goal of helping to destroy U.S. imperialism. And uh, that's why I do not hold any grudges against the People's Republic of China. So, so you said one of your goals is destroying the U.S. imperialism. Why is that? Because it's a major foe of progress. It's trying to overthrow countries like Cuba who are seeking to improve the well-being of their people. Likewise, Venezuela. It's a major enemy of human progress. A major enemy of human progress. So I think now it, you should be happy with what South, the position that South Africa is taking with regards to what's going on in Ukraine. Well, clearly. Um, and also, um, um, to, to give you an idea of how things are changing rapidly, I'm sure you heard the news about President Macron of France trying to get an invitation to the BRICS summit, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa summit in uh, South Africa in a few weeks. Now, there are a number of ways to look at it. Maybe Mr. Macron sees which way the winds are blowing and opportunistically, uh, he's trying to uh, ride the winning horse, which is the BRICS, or you could see it as an attempt for him to engage in deviltry by showing up to the BRICS summit in order to either spy or act as a saboteur. Whatever the case, it shows you that the world is changing. And I'm happy to see that South Africa is in the vanguard of these changes. And we are we also seeing Egypt submitting an application to join BRICS. Saudi Arabia, Algeria, the list is long. Yeah, seems like now African countries have a lot of alternatives and options to choose from. Clearly. It didn't used to be the case before. Clearly. It says a lot about Africa and the trajectory that it's going to be taking. It certainly does. So what do you think about about um 
so Tanzania is having one of the biggest pipeline projects and one of the of the pushbacks have been you know climate change and that Tanzania can't implement the project because of that what do you think about it it's a natural gas pipeline i take yes it. the natural gas pipeline well I mean, it, it, it's 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 a very difficult question i mean we all know that the burning of fo fossil fuels is compromising the fate of the planet because it contributes to climate change and the overheating of the planet. At the same time, you see a country like Saudi Arabia, which in the last year or so had the most significant economic growth of any nation, about eight plus percent. Most of that's based upon selling of uh, petroleum which is noted uh, contributes to climate change. Now, the Saudis, they tell us that they're taking that wealth, that short-term wealth, and plowing it into other enterprises. For example, they've just taken over the golfing industry, for example. Uh, they're trying to build new cities. If Tanzania is going to take the money generated by this natural gas pipeline, and devoted to education, devoted to healthcare, and does not necessarily see this natural gas pipeline as a long-term solution, well, it's difficult to quarrel with that kind of projection. So what do you think are some of the future challenges that African countries would face in terms of uh, economic development in the coming years, ones that they should be thinking about? Well, they should be thinking about how to spend more on education, how to spend more on healthcare, how to make sure that the imperialist countries led by the United States do not interfere in their internal affairs which of course is going to be a priority. Uh, I think that that's what they should be thinking about. And when we speak about education, what type of education are we speaking about? Because the current curriculums that most African countries have, these are curriculums that were adopted after colonialism. Are these still curriculums that we should be expecting African countries to use? Well, curriculums involving foundational education in mathematics, foundational education in biology, in physics, in chemistry, uh, accurate renderings of the past, that is to say, uh, history, for example. I mean, I, you know, it seems to me this is obvious. It is, but that doesn't happen to be the case on the ground. Well, everything is a struggle, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's true. Because most of the times, you know, you'd hear students complaining about, about curriculums and what they're learning in school. And right now, uh, even in Tanzania, right, students who are graduating from universities, most of those who expected, you know, to get jobs from the government, they're now told to go out and, uh, you know, create job opportunities for themselves. And so that's a huge challenge because these individuals were never prepared for that. And they're just told at the moment they graduate. And so you have a lot of things happening at the same time. And, you know, when you speak about changing the curriculum as as clear as it might sound, it, it doesn't happen to be the case. And I don't know why that is. There are those who have an interest in maintaining and perpetuating the status quo uh, because they're challenged and threatened by change. And that leads to a struggle. That's why you need a student union. If students or concerned with that issue, obviously they need to organize. They need to uh, organize to ensure that their interests are being heard by the government. Doctor, for the first time we are seeing African countries and African people adapting technology the moment it's out. And that never used to be the case. For example, when you speak about, you know, artificial intelligence and software such as ChatGPT, we're also having access to them. How do you think that technological advancements are putting Africa in a better position in terms of development and progress? Well, it allows Africa to leapfrog into the future. For example, 
uh, I'm old enough to realize when people use the telephone, they mostly use landlines. These mobile phones, which are more or less ubiquitous, were not on the scene. And then you had to replace landlines with mobile phones, which is still ongoing. African nations can escape the landline phenomenon for the most part and move directly to mobile phones, mobile telephony, for example, particularly with the assistance of friends in China. So that gives Africa an advantage for the future. That's true. It really does. And I think we should also be pushing, I was speaking with uh, with, with Milton and Milton Alimadi, and one of the things he said is that African countries should be pushing for both money and and uh, and technology when they're making negotiations in terms of uh, their natural resources, right? So with regards to technologies, you know, sell us some of your technology. We want to build industries this side so we produce some of the things ourselves rather than just buying them every single time. Well, of course. And you, actually, you see that already happening. As wages rise in China and as the imperialist countries wake up to the idea that perhaps they should not have as money, as much capital invested in China, you see a migration of manufacturing to East Africa, particularly to uh, Ethiopia, to a certain extent to Kenya. Uh, that's an ongoing process. The only question is how rapidly will it take place? Yeah, and and given the, the projected population growth of young people in the continent, I think that also gives Africa an advantage. For sure. But it all is going to turn on education. 